Hey, so today I'd like to quickly go through a IPython notebook I created on how to estimate the shape of a mountain. Um, I'm not using GTSAM, but I'm using just arbitrary um, linear algebra, but there is a connection with factor graphs. Um, and then I will show how the eigenvectors of a particular graph have a deep connection with um, the factor graph and the matrix is associated with it. So, so this is Mount Rainier's factor graph and its eigenvectors. So um, I'll just run the code here and uh, the, the notebook is available, the blog post is available with all the cells evaluated so you can uh, run this notebook by yourself. First we'll need some libraries, so I'll do shift enter and it gives me a warning and I'll run anyway. Um, and so it's loading some libraries we need. And while this is going on, I'll, uh, I'll talk about Mount Rainier. So, so you know, assume your friends and, and, uh, and yourself, you have climbed, climbed Mount Rainier and you're able to obtain a large number of relative height measurements. So you know where you are, but you know, so you take a measurement between where you are and where one of your friends is. Um, can we reconstruct the shape of the mountain just from those relative height measurements? And yeah, you can actually. And uh, so, uh, but there is a there is there is something you can't get, which is the absolute height of the mountain, because you only took relative measurements. And we'll see this uh, come back later in this uh, uh, notebook. To simulate this, I used a digital elevation model, which is um, which is just a, a like an image with heights, you know, and so. I'll, Download that uh, and, and show it here. So this is a DEM of uh, Mount Rainier, um, and this is pixels, and uh, the height is encoded in, in values from zero to two fifty five. So it's all scaled, and not not uh, not real heights. Um, but you know we'll abstract away from that in this uh, in this chat. So first we'll get some sample points, meaning we will simulate where you and your friends would have been and. Maybe a bit unrealistic, but I sampled 500 uh, points here using uh, using NumPy, so I'll just run that, um, and you can see where where I, I drew it is. Um, I use 500 because it gives a nice shape. So this this um, uh, it's interesting. It also shows that you know you have to don't have to be afraid of large number of measurements because this is just the sample points, not not the measurements. Uh, we'll have many more measurements. All the matrices involved are sparse, and so this is still very simple computationally. Um, to get the actual measurements, we first filter out. You see that there is these black borders here, right? So let's filter those out. Just a little, a little code snippet here. We'll get the the actual height values in um, in this uh, variable z, and from that z, we'll create relative measurements. So how do we do that? Well. Um, we'll use a graph that we derive from the k nearest neighbors. So we'll go and take, in this case, the six k nearest neighbors between these 500 points, for each of the 500 points, and then generate a, uh, a relative height measurement for these six edges. And we do this for all the points. Now, of course, many of these edges are shared between neighbors, right? So um, there is a... Um, nearest neighbors class in, uh, in, in sklearn, so we'll use that. And so A here is actually an undirected graph of, um, of um, nearest neighbors. Um, there is a little bit of a bug in Colab. This, this, this cell is now evaluated, um, but sometimes it turns into a, well, I, I guess if I hover over it, I can replay it. Um, and then we'll create a graph. So how do we create a graph from that Undirected graph. Um, well, what we do is we create a um, an, a network X graph uh, from that sparse matrix, which which was given by nearest neighbors, and then we'll ask for the oriented uh, incidence matrix, and that is in fact exactly um, equivalent to the factor graph. So we'll have one row, which is one factor for each relative measurement with a one and a minus one, taking the uh, the height difference. Um, and then we'll simulate from it by just, you know, doing H times Z, which is the ground root. H is a large skinny matrix 
of uh, say a thousand by five hundred or two thousand by five hundred. Um, we'll, we'll figure that out here, and it will just add some random noise. In this case, with uh, one standard deviation. So let's do that. This is a histogram, um, and I didn't print M, but I can very quickly do that. So if I do print um, uh, M N N, which is the size of H, you can see that we have eighteen hundred measurements. For 500 unknowns, and this is a histogram of those measurements. You'll see it's signed somewhere, you know, it goes from minus 40 to 40. And most of them are, are zero because we're, you know, a lot of edges are close by, and so you didn't actually walk far on the mountain. Now, the, the matrix H, um, if you try to do least squares, actually, you'll get a, an error uh, because of this absolute height issue. Uh, so we'll add one row to H to clamp one of the one of the uh, estimated variables, so the, the first one, to 100. So I'll do a little bit of sparse math, uh, sparse matrix uh, manipulation here, and then we'll call this function uh, least squares, which which actually um, will give us the answer. So um, that was easy um, to see what we got. Let's render it. So here we should get a nice little Mount Rainier. Uh, oh, and that's that's not bad at all, right? So um, I could show you a picture of Mount Rainier just by quickly Googling it. Um, and I, you know, let's see. So, so here is Mount Rainier um, and a bunch of pictures. So, um, you know, not unrealistic. Um, what's... what's um, What's happening is I just plotted the points because it was just uh, too much work to go get a, an aligned uh, RGB image and then texture map it. But you, but you could do that. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, how do you estimate the shape of a mountain from a bunch of relative measurements? Um, okay. Now, I, 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 want, I, I wanted to give this as a motivating example uh, because I like to really talk to you about graph Laplacians. So the large but very sparse measurement matrix H that we used above is called the Jacobian. Okay, the Jacobian of the objective function, which is a quadratic, and this is the, the objective function. So it's, it's uh, H times Z, um, Z is the unknown uh, quantity, minus the measurements, and then square that. And that's just a multivariate quadratic, and its curvature is given by uh, H transpose H, which is also called the Hessian. Um, the Hessian is also known as the information matrix uh, because it tells us about where we have a lot of information and where we don't have a lot of information. We'll, we'll get into that. And that's also equal to the inverse of the covariance matrix. Um, so so, so that's, uh, that's interesting to know. Significance of all this is that um, Q, the Hessian, tells us about how much we know about these estimated heights, right? Um, and this is all under under an assumption of identically distributed uh, Gaussian noise um, with a standard deviation of one and a mean of zero. Um, okay, so the standard deviation we can actually change, uh, and then Q will change uh, in in, um, uh, in 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 not in shape, but the values of Q will change. And we can even uh, accord a different uh, standard deviation to each different measurement, uh, and Q will appropriately change. But for now, let's do a standard deviation of, of one, and let's um, let's examine what Q is. Now, it's a bit cumbersome to do this for Mount Rainier, so why don't we make a little 1D mountain, okay? So we'll, we'll walk up a mountain, you know, and here's my mountain, my 1D mountain. Um, you know, and, and uh, let's take some relative measurements. And here we can just create a graph from the edges. So we'll have a measurement between 0 and 1, between 1 and 2. But we'll also skip 1. So between 0 and 2, we'll also have a measurement. So that's given in this graph. Um, and uh, here, uh, I'll, I'll print again, print uh, M, N, right? Oops, I am... Um, mistyped that and an N. So this is a nine by six uh, matrix H. Okay. 
And why don't we just print H as well, just for you to see. It's a sparse matrix, so I'll do two array here um, to print it out completely. So you can see again, you know, so one, one edge is one row, and that's a factor in a factor graph, and the columns uh, correspond to variables, which are the, the unknown heights. Okay, we, we did generate this from the ground truth heights, but really in estimation, we're looking for the unknowns. Uh, this is a typo. Uh, this is a six by six matrix. Uh, if you calculate the Hessian, let's calculate the Hessian. Uh, and so this is the Hessian. Okay. All right. So graph theory also defines another matrix for any undirected graph, which is the, the a diagonal matrix called the degree matrix and the incidence uh, or adjacency matrix of the graph. Um, and if you print this, uh, network X has a, a, a method, you know, in there, we could see, drum roll, uh, that this is exactly the same as a Hessian. Well, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, because, you know, in many cases, the Laplacian matrix is sort of stated as, okay, here's this thing, uh, L is D minus A. And I never really sort of figured out where it came from. Um, but now we can see that there is a one-to-one -one relationship between that the, the Laplacian is in fact a Hessian for this relative height measurement problem. All right, after some coffee, let's continue. Uh, that's pretty amazing uh, because in fact, graph theory has a lot to say about this graph Laplacian. So let's try and make that connection. Um, a lot of what there is to say um, is about uh, eigenvectors and eigenvalues, okay? So SVD can give us the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of L. Um, and we can, uh, so here's the eigenvalues. This is this little, uh, this vector here. Uh, and then the eigenvectors are uh, in the columns here. Now, um, because we have that the Laplacian is equal to the Hessian, uh, we can also uh, take the SVD of H because we know that the Hessian is H transpose H. Okay. Um, and so by taking the SVD of H and just looking at S and V, uh, we actually get identical results. Okay. So if you want, you can calculate that SVD, uh, the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of Q just by looking at the matrix H. All right. So let's now look at some properties that are often um, stated in the context of graph Laplacian. So first of all, the smallest eigenvalue is L is zero. Uh, and its associated eigenvector is all ones up to a scale. Uh, let's, let's check that. Uh, indeed, eigenvalue is zero, the smallest eigenvalue. And the eigenvector associated with it is 0 0.41 repeated. Um, and this is easily um, interpreted. Uh, this is exactly the statement that we cannot recover the absolute height of the mountain. Okay, um, we can add 0 0.41 or one or any scalar multiple of this eigenvector, and our objective function or error function will not uh, budge. Okay, because um, because the measurements will stay the same no matter how high you put the mountain. So if we if we add five, then the relative measurements stay the same. So nothing changes really. So the objective function, which only checks the difference with between relative measurements, is is just um, uninformative with respect to the absolute height. So that's interesting. Okay, that's why the the first eigenvector is one and the first eigenvalue is zero. Okay. Well, uh, another uh, interesting property is that if, if the second eigenvalue happens to be zero as well, uh, people in graph theory know that the graph is disconnected. We can actually easily simulate that by taking uh, H and putting it as uh, two graphs. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll just, you know, take two block matrices and disconnect them um, and, and get the eigenvectors and eigenvalues. 
And you'll see that the eigenvalues now are all, you know, sort of um, duplicated, uh, including the zeros. And the eigenvector is associated with these zero eigenvalues. Um, it's zero for the first component and, and one for all the other ones. Uh, and one for the first component and then zero for the second component. And that's not very surprising. You know, basically what we did is we, we took two mountains, walked around two, two mountains, uh, and we have a bunch of relative height measurements. We again have un unknown uh, absolute height, and we can we can we can change those independently from each other, right? And the reason is uh, we didn't make any relative measurements between the two mountain tops, so we have a disconnected graph, and we have two eigenvectors, um, sort of messing with the absolute height. Um, there is a whole field of spectral partitioning and clustering that uses that um, in an approximate way, saying, hey, if we can find small eigenvalues and the corresponding eigenvector will, will sort of have this independent motion property um, and um, then we'll separate cluster this, this graph into two pieces or more pieces, right? So. Uh, we can appreciate that by, in this case, which where the graph is completely disconnected, we'll just plot those two eigenvectors, right? And you can see that, you know, they, they really nicely sort of split the graph in two. Okay, so that's, that's cute and, and easy to understand. So let's go to uh, one of the most important properties of the Laplacian, which is called the algebraic connectivity. Now that is just the smallest non-zero eigenvalue. So let's uh, print that. In this case, uh, we just took you know eigenvalues minus two, which is the smallest um, a non-zero eigenvalue. And in network X, can actually do this uh, by exploring the sparsity of G. So that's that's typically faster to to calculate than uh, than asking uh, for all the eigenvalues and then just grabbing the, the second one. Um, so, so both of them uh, give the same result, which is in this case 1.19, right? So what does this mean? Well, um, let me, let me talk about not um, the algebraic connectivity, which is also called the Fiedler value, but let's talk about the Fiedler vector, which is the eigenvector associated with the Fiedler value. All right, so let's do that. Um, let's print it and plot it. So here is a plot of uh, that first eigenvector that is associated with a non-zero eigenvalue. And <clears throat> in the, um, you know, spectral partitioning sense, you can see that, you know, the left and the half, uh, right half are, are separated by zero. So that's something that happens in, in spectral partitioning a lot. We just threshold on zero and get two different clusters. But I'd like to talk about the interpretation of this Fiedler vector, right? Which is, it's it's six long, and remember our mountain was six data points, right? So, uh, and and nine measurements. Now, if we perturb the solution according to this eigenvector, which in this case is sort of you know going left to right, left to right, we will incur a change in the objective value. Which, which will be a quadratic. Um, so if, if you multiply zero at this eigenvector, we'll get zero change. If we um, you know, multiply this eigenvector with one, we'll get an error. The error will go up uh, quadratically with a curvature equal to 1.19. Um, and, and so in, in fact, for one, it will be 1.19 because, because we'll get 1.19 times error, you know, error, you know, that magnitude squared and one squared is, is, um, is one, of course, but then it will go up quadratically, right? Um, so that's pretty cool. That is, um, the, the direction in which the error function or that objective function goes up the slowest, right? Other eigenvalues are higher than this. And so if we perturb in a different direction, the error will go up much faster. Um, that's interesting because um, this tells us that this direction is the one that we are least certain about. Uh, because remember, the, the Hessian is called the information matrix, and the eigenvalue associated with a particular direction 
is the information we have in a particular um, direction. So in this direction, we have 1.19, and that's the, the direction with the smallest information. Also, the Hessian is the inverse of the of the um, um, of the uh, covariance matrix, and the covariance matrix measures uncertainty. So one over 119 is going to be the highest uncertainty. All the other i values will divide by, uh, you know, so this, they're equal to precisions. So we'll have one, you know, so the the the, the covariance is the inverse of the eigenvalue or in a, in in a particular direction. So this one is the most uncertain um, direction. So what about the remaining eigenvectors and eigenvalues? We, we sort of hinted at them, and they are... Uh, so let's plot them to, to get some insight, okay? Uh, here are all the other ones. And so what we'll see is that, you know, I didn't plot zero because that's just a constant. I didn't plot the Fiedler value because we, we just looked at that, the Fiedler vector. All of these, you know, look at the, the red one, which is associated with, you know, eigenvalue three. It's a change which which is sort of a low frequency change, as opposed to the blue one, which, which sort of goes up and down much faster, right? And so um, that's interesting uh, in the sense that this, so the eigenvectors are sort of increasingly high frequency modes associated with higher and higher error. And this encodes the intuition that because we took um, least, you know, the, the, the closest neighbors to calculate relative measurements, um, you know, things that are close together are very well, um, there's a high correlation between them in the estimate. So we cannot change them independently without incurring high error. Our measurements are very informative about how, what the relative value is of, of values on the mountain that are sort of, that are, you know, close together. By the way, you know, so the SVD does seems to do something with, with sort of spatial frequencies. Um, and in fact, uh, it is a generalization of the Fourier transform. If we take a graph that is a ring, okay, um, and we, we, we simulate sort of relative measurements around that ring, we will in fact uh, get the discrete Fourier transform. So let's, let's very quickly do that here. We'll take a larger graph, 64 nodes. Uh, and this is a graph, and the um, uh, these are some eigenvectors associated with this graph. Okay, so these are the two uh, lowest frequency components associated with the lowest eigenvalues. There is this green one, which is eigenvalue zero, which is the DC component in the Fourier transform, and then we have a sine and a cosine basically with uh, low low frequency, and then. The next uh, higher uh, eigenvalues are associated with sines and cosines of double the frequency. Okay, so mind blown if you know what, where the DFT comes from or the Fourier transform. It is simply the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of a graph that forms a ring. Uh, so this is this. Um, you know, you can you can do a whole talk about the fact that we can sort of move around the ring without changing anything. Uh, and the eigenvectors of that operation are, in, in, in fact, exactly the, uh, the Fourier basis. Um, but now we can also understand this in the, uh, in the sort of error function Hessian uh, interpretation. These modes, <clears throat> when I move, uh, you know, when I change the estimate around the ring in this cosine or sine way, I will incur very little error, okay? Um, I'm going to skip the last bit, um, but let me go and um, talk to um, talk about Mount Rainier. So let's get take it back to the actual mountain here, right? So we can just calculate the Fiedler value very quickly using um, Network X, which uses uh, an efficient uh, small eigenvalue calculation. Um, that works for very large graphs, actually. So you, you can try to do this using an, an SVD or an eigenvalue uh, decomposition in, in NumPy, but it will be very expensive, and that network X to something smarter. And so <clears throat> we can see that the Fiedler value is 0.05, okay? 
and the vector associated with it is this one. It's not very informative, okay? It's um, and it's because we 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 just have this one-dimensional representation of the vector here, which which um, it's much more informative to actually plot this on the mountain, which is what I'll do now. Uh, so here it is, uh, and so you can see that now the mountain is colored. Um, green is positive, red is a negative, and yellow is around zero. Now, uh, this perspective view is still a bit uh, hard to see, so why don't we look at it from the top? Uh, and this is what this is. And so what we see is that the Fiedler vector, okay, neatly splits the mountain in half. So, so, so what happens is from all these relative measurements and this particular graph that we use to create relative measurements, we can, we can sort of vary the mountain in this particular direction, right, without incurring a high uh, error in the objective function. Um, so the objective function will, will go up very slowly when we do that. And so that's the direction in which we have the least information about the shape of the mountain, okay? Um, <clears throat> you can think about higher frequency components. I haven't plotted here, but but they will sort of be more, you know, modes associated that we can also sort of change in, you know, almost independently without, um, without, and this is the, the intuition, changing sort of the relative heights of nearby nodes about which we have the most information. So if you look at a small patch of the mountain, we'll be pretty sure about the relative topology there. Um, but we don't just, we just don't know how it fits in the rest of the mountain because we could sort of apply this low frequency change and still, you know, get, get basically the same measurements, right? But the same predicted measurements that agree with our actual measurements. All right, so I'll close by saying that the relative height measurements on Mount Rainier is a very specific example of a class of problems called synchronization problems, uh, in which you are given a set of pairwise measurements, and our goal is to, absolute, to, to estimate the absolute quantities, in this case, the heights. Now, as I said, the absolute, absolute quantity we won't get. You know, there's always this gauge freedom. Um, but we, we, you know, modulo that, we can, we can definitely do this. Um, and in computer vision in particular, um, rotation averaging is, a, is, is one of the most studied um, uh, synchronization problems. Um, and we just wrote a paper about that at uh, uh, ECCV, you might have seen that video, um, on called shown and rotation averaging. And in that paper, in fact, the eigenvalue, the, the, that smallest non-zero eigenvalue and its associated eigenvector play a large role. So, um, uh, so I encourage you to read the paper if you want to sort of go in depth uh, and, and hopefully this gives you a bit of an introduction as to what this Laplacian graph and its eigenvalue uh, and eigenvector uh, structure, what they actually mean. Um, all right, so uh, that's it. I'll sign off here.